on this edition of Independent Sources, Bank Fraud, the only bank to be prosecuted in relation to the 2008 financial crisis defends its name and legacy. That story and more coming up. Independent Sources, your window to the city's ethnic and immigrant communities. Here's your host, Gary Pierre-Pierre. The phrase, too big to fail, has become synonymous with the 2008 financial crisis that nearly toppled the United States and the world's economy. It's also become a source of visceral anger for many Americans who believe that none of the banks face indictment for their practices. That's not completely true. One did. The Chinatown-based Abacus Federal Savings Bank was the only one prosecuted by the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. A new film by Hoop Dreams director Steve James tells the story of the community bank that fought a five-year legal battle to protect its name and legacy. I spoke to James via Skype about the new film now airing on PBS. Today, we are announcing the indictment of a federal savings bank on mortgage fraud, securities fraud, and conspiracy. A federally chartered bank that has been catering to the Chinese immigrant community since 1984. If you are going to pick on a bank, family-owned company, wedged between a couple of noodle shops in Chinatown, is about as easy a target as you could possibly pick. When I was a lawyer, there was no bank owned by Chinese and serving the Chinese. When I walk around here, I feel very much at home. This is a very uh, tasty uh, noodle shop. That's always special. That's the butt. <laughs> when we were children, my dad was excited about this bank he was going to start. We serve people who've never even dealt with the banking system before. This whole ordeal began in 2009. One of our loan officers stole money. He was lying all over the place. He was running a money laundering operation. I fired him that day. They went straight to their regulator, and they told them about it. The DA's office started asking us questions. Wait a minute, maybe we're the target. If that prosecution goes through, that bank is going to go out of business. Although this is David versus Goliath, they're a whole family of lawyers. We spent a lot of time investigating and ended up absolutely convinced that the loan department was corrupt through and through. They routinely falsified mortgage documents. Reporters in this town were treated to this extraordinary photo opportunity, this almost Stalinist-looking chain gang. Herded like cattle down the hallway. I've been doing this for 25 years, and I'd never seen that happen. Mommy's worried. Papa's 80 years old. He's been up to 5.30 AM. He has nothing to eat for dinner. Let's, let's get you some food. Papa, you do. This is how he is. He's very calm, and I'm like a jumping bean, so I'm always running around. You better eat now. You are going to the land, OK? You're not a young kid anymore. The state is killing you. Abacus Federal Savings Bank had one of the nation's lowest default rates, not the highest, one of the lowest. Frankly, if every bank had underwritten as well as Abacus, we wouldn't have had a financial crisis. People get the wrong impression that Chinese are not law-abiding. This case is an attack on our community. We're easy prey. Too big to fail turns into small enough to jail, and Abacus is small enough to jail. So, Steve, uh... Explain this to our audience. This bank discovered that there was a mortgage fraud going on by one of, a couple of its brokers, and then it self-reported uh, the uh, action to the authorities, and it ended up being prosecuted for fraud itself, for mortgage fraud. How did this happen? Well, what happened is, is that Cyrus Vance Jr., the DA of New York, uh, I think he really believed that Abacus was guilty. I don't think he was cynical to believe that they weren't. But I think his judgment was clouded by um, the fact that he wanted to be the DA, I think, that brought a bank to justice in the wake of the 2008 crisis. And I think he saw Abacus as a perfect candidate for that, even though Abacus was a very small bank, even though they discovered the fraud themselves and reported the fraud uh, and sort of did everything that was asked of them and more. Uh, for whatever reason, Vance believed that they were complicit in the fraud and decided to put them on trial, and I think it was opportunism. Can you say perhaps uh, they were targeted because they were Chinese or there were certain uh, biases towards uh, Chinese banks doing business in America, and they just felt 
they could just take, pick on this one because it was small. I don't think that the racism that went on here, and I do think racism went on, was the overt kind of racism uh, you know, that we've seen too much of this in this country. I do think there was racism at work, but it was it was the kind that if you when you raise that question to Mr. Vance, which I did, and say, you know, there's a feeling in the community that that this was a, a racist prosecution, you know, he vociferously disagreed. But when he disagreed, he said, look, um, we didn't treat Abacus any differently than we would a South American bank or an Indian bank. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to me, that was quite revealing. So basically, uh, he I, admitted that he had issue with these foreign banks operating here. Well, I think that what it was is if he were sitting here talking to you, he would say, no, I do not at all have an issue. I, I, I welcome the diversity of banking in this country. But I think that in the case of Abacus, I think that he saw a bank that would be easier to prosecute than if he were to try to take on Bank of America in New York City. And I think that he... His judgment was clouded, I, you know, by a, a desire to be the guy that prosecuted a bank. And I think that, you know, if he looked at Abacus and looked at the community is from, he is an elected official. I don't know if it was in his mind or not, but it's true that he didn't have to worry about um, a politically disenfranchised group of people like Chinese immigrants in New York City politically. You know, uh, the, the film, you have... Uh this this segment there where you know you have the whole family and chance they're just walking them like a uh, perp walk and uh, the, this is not how white collar criminals are often portrayed why is it I thought that was a bit excessive no. to really uh, humiliate the, the the family the way they did you could say that that in and of itself was racist um, because had that been white uh, collar white bankers or, you know, of similar types of suspects that that likely would not have happened, one could argue. But I think that the chaining together of the ex-employees and the low-level employees, which is what happened in that perp walk, was a spectacle. And it was a spectacle designed, I think, by Vance in his office to try to make a big deal of this prosecution. And, you know, it's not like they were members of the uh, Medellin drug cartel being paraded down the corridors of the courthouse. These were like low-level, mostly ex-loan officers for Abacus. Mm -hmm. So now in the end, uh, the government lost the case. Uh, and, and so what was the takeaway here? What's the moral of this story for the government in terms of going after a bank that's very small and, and, and doesn't have a lot of resources to defend itself, and yet they were able to, to, to be vindicated? You know, I think there is a number of messages here. One is, is that this is very much a story about the unequal application of justice in America, that, and, and that the hammer of that tends to fall inordinately on people who are poor, people who are color, of color, and immigrants. And this is certainly that kind of story. Um, the difference here is, is that this was a bank. They, they, the, the sons aren't poor. You know, They're not Bank of America rich, but they're not poor. Sure. And they were determined to defend themselves. And most people who find themselves in this position are not in a position to do that. They roll over, whether they're innocent or not, they roll over and plead because they, they can't afford to defend themselves, and the songs did. So I think this is an important story about fighting back. It's also a story about the exoneration of a community and of a bank that um, was unfairly targeted for a prosecution connected to a crisis of which they had no connection to whatsoever. Abacus, the, the fraud that went on at Abacus that Abacus discovered and set about to correct had nothing whatsoever to do with what went on in 2008. Abacus wasn't engaged in credit default swaps. They weren't engaged in subprime mortgage packaging or any of those things. This was just very low level fraud being engaged by borrowers who wanted to buy a home and actually were good for the money for the for the home because none of these loans that were under indictment went into default. Abacus's default rate on mortgages is 120th the national average. They are an exemplary institution in so many ways. So uh, what was the community's reaction? I mean, did they see this as a, 
uh, persecution or prosecution of them as a, as a community, or did they isolate it just like this bank as a, a, a special case? Well, the community, I think, for the large, uh, for the most part, rallied around Abacus. There was tremendous coverage of the case in the Chinese American press in New York City because Abacus was a uh, a, a pillar in that community, and Thomas Sung especially is so that that there was um, there was real concern and consternation on the part of the community about how this was going to turn out. Why well, do you want people to get out of this watching this documentary? This story of a small bank being uh, picked on in the wake of this financial crisis is more than just a footnote to that crisis. It's it shows in sharp relief what wasn't done when it related to the big banks who almost crashed the world economy and what was done to a tiny bank that was innocent. Um, I also think it's an important story of resilience and, uh, and, and this, about this incredible Chinese American family. And the heart of this story really is their journey, their struggle, their perseverance and courage. Uh, and, and that's really the emotional heart of this story. Thank you very much, Steve. Je thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Abacus, Small Enough to Jail, premiered on September 12th and is available online at pbs.org slash frontline slash abacus. Still to come on the show, finding affordable housing for fleeing victims of domestic abuse. Thanks for staying tuned. Last year, there were over 80,000 calls reporting domestic violence in May 2311, a signal to many advocates that the problem is not getting any better. What's worse is that for many of them who do call, the problem is not so easily solved. Sometimes it's so extreme that many flee their homes in an effort to escape their abusers. That can be a case of leaping out of the proverbial frying pan and into the fire because many of these people end up homeless with no safety net. Project Home is an initiative created to help these victims. It was started by the nonprofit New Destiny Housing and run in collaboration with the mayor's office to combat domestic violence. Zyphus LeBrun spoke to Project Home uh, Director Julie Rodriguez and Jennifer DiCali, the Assistant Commissioner of Family Justice Center Operations, about the program. Julie Rodriguez and Jennifer DiCarli, thank you very much for being in studio with me today. You're welcome. Thank you for Thanks having for us. inviting us. All right, awesome. All right, so we're here to talk a little bit about uh, Project Home, and I wanted to start specifically to talk a little bit about the, the correlation between domestic violence and, and homelessness. And Julie, how does domestic violence end up leading to, to homelessness? So um, part of the, the biggest issue with domestic violence is that it involves families. Families usually with uh, mothers and children, although we also have uh, single parents or just single adults that are needing to flee the, their current location because of safety concerns. And you're uprooting an entire family, their school, their sense of community, and moving them to uh, unknown locations, staying with family members, and in some cases, shelter. Uh, shelters with, which have specific stays, and so sometimes after these stays are over, these families have nowhere to go, and then we, we run into, into it affecting not just an individual or the stereotype that we have for homelessness, but just families in general. All right. And now, um, Jennifer, mm -hmm. you, um, you work with the mayor's office um, and, uh, to, combat, to combat domestic mm -hmm. violence, and so let's talk a little bit about the prevalence of domestic sure. violence in the city itself. I mean, how widespread is it? Yeah, I mean, we definitely have a lot of numbers that show that it's definitely a, an issue, and that's what my office's uh, kind of goal is, is to coordinate the city's delivery of domestic violence services. So with numbers, you know, in 2016, we had over 80,000 calls to the New York City Domestic Violence Hotline. Um, my job at the office is to oversee the city's five family justice centers, which are one-stop shopping centers, for lack of a better way of describing them, for survivors of domestic violence. And last year alone, we had 62,000 and client visits to those five centers. Wow, so 62,000. Yeah, across the city for five family justice and this is And this is 62,000 individual calls, not 62,000 people, because one call could represent a family of four, as you were just saying, or something like that, right, Julie? So, Correct. yeah, if those 62,000 are actually um, in-person visits to the right. family justice centers, and it could be one person coming 10 times or one person coming once. Right, yeah. I see. So now, Julie, 
these folks who are calling in uh, and they're directed you guys the, the two organizations work together and kind yes. of trying to sort through the numbers and so forth um those f folks coming to um, project home is there a specific um, kind of criteria that they need to meet to be a part of the program? So, and, and John, please correct me mm. if I'm wrong, but in order to come into the uh, Family Justice Center, there is no criteria. And so what we ask is that clients are referred from the case managers that are currently working at the Family Justice Centers because a lot of uh, the work that they're going to be doing with us requires a little bit more support. We do pro uh, require our clients to provide sensitive documentation to give us updates and some services that they're receiving. Um, and so usually we train the case managers at the Family Justice Centers um, that are there both full-time and part-time from different organizations on what specifically we're looking for. And because Project Home is a pilot program that's looking to house clients with a specific type of housing, which is through low-income tax credit units, the main criteria we're asking for is that they fit into the income guidelines okay. that are determined by HUD per family size. Okay. And then we'll take on the, the role from there. And what are some of those uh, specific? So they, they change every year. Um, and so for a family of one, it, since we're working with 40% of AMI, uh, we're looking at someone that's making uh, approximately $28,000 up to $36,000 annually. And this is all forms of verifiable income. And I think that's key to understand what we do because it's definitely higher than a lot of people are expecting. Mm -hmm. But we do take into consideration things like uh, child support, their employed income, if they do have a subsidy, the amount that that subsidy is giving them on a, on a monthly or annual basis, um, family assistance if they're providing it, if they're receiving it, I mean, um, and anything else that we can definitely verify and account for to, to our landlord partners. Mm -hmm. and the only thing I would add to what Julie said is that um, for someone seeking help with domestic violence, the only criteria for family justice centers is that you identify as a survivor of domestic violence, sex trafficking, or elder abuse. Mm -hmm. um, the services are all free, and they're really one-stop shop. So you walk in that door, and there's going to be a brief screening and then connected to a case mm -hmm. manager who will identify what challenges or what issues you're facing, one of which might be housing instability, where you really need to be connected, hopefully, with a program like Project Home that could assist mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. And how do folks get in touch with with, with your organization? So Family Justice Centers um, are located in all five boroughs, as I mentioned, and they're walk-in centers. You don't need appointments. Um, and you can call 311 for all of the addresses or call the city's domestic violence hotline, 1-800-621-HOPE. Um, um, and so they will give you the address, and you can just walk in and get help. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so far, how many clients has Project Hope been able to put into um, this affordable system? So right now we're still in pilot. Um, we finish our pilot mode in September of this year. Um, and uh, we've been able to place 43 families. And the families range from uh, single people to women with children as well as men uh, with children or, or men on independent. Um, we've also had a 100% retention rate, which is really one of the greatest things that we're extremely proud of and happy in regards to the pilot program. What this means is that some of the families that have been placed are on their second year lease and some are even signing up to their third year lease. So our hope is that we can really continue to uh, identify how, how we've been this successful so that we can try to eliminate the the revisits to to homelessness and homeless shelters right are you working with landlords to uh, in, in this regard we are so project home is, is a program that's part of new destiny housing and new destiny itself is a nonprofit developer and so from all of our years in working and that we've learned of certain things that landlords work, work look for and so we've managed to have 19 relationships with a combination of for-profit and non-profit landlords mm -hmm. we also know what they're looking for in regards to when they're analyzing their applications so we help this is what we bring back to the family justice centers and to our clients we help them overcome these barriers um, and so since the relationship is so strong with these 19 landlords, it's it's an easier path right. to get them from point A to point B. And you mentioned they're looking for specifics. Could you give us one or two of the specifics that they're looking sure. for? Sure. So um, the, the landlords pull a credit report and a full background check. They have their own mechanism of doing so. Um, uh, it usually pulls from Experian, which is the one of the credit reporting uh, agencies, but it also looks at uh, any history with housing court and also any criminal background. Um, in regard, the biggest barriers tend to be if they have prior housing court records. This is a, an indication to some landlords that they may 
potentially have issues with them in the future, um, and also criminal. Um, depending if there's any violent crimes, they, they're looking out for their other tenants. Right. So those are the, the, the biggest barriers that we have. Right. However, because we know that our landlords, um, our, our, sorry, I'm sorry, our clients have been faced with safety concerns or financial abuse, in some cases they do have housing court records that are pertained to the violence right. and to the domestic violence. So we help them overcome to navigate that. that. Domestic violence is often levied against women, mm -hmm. but Julie mentioned the fact that there were single dads involved mm -hmm. in it. Yep. What's, yeah. what's kind of, is that also a, a significant portion of the, the folks who are kind of reporting that there's been violence? Yeah, cases? so, um, you know, nationally and here in the city, we definitely see that more um, women, you know, there are more reports of domestic violence by women, and there are obviously more domestic violence acts committed against women, and it's still a more gendered issue, mm -hmm. but we definitely, in the Family Justice Centers, will see anybody wherever they identify, however they identify whatever their gender identity is so mm -hmm. right now I think approximately 85% of our um, clients coming in the doors are women identifying as women and about 15% are identifying as male as male yeah is it more difficult for men to find housing have you find found Julie at least not not from our program um, I don't know the statistics of when they're going out looking for housing on their own mm -hmm. but it, for our program it's been it's been the same mm -hmm. it, we're really focusing on the barriers that present in the in their background checks and I think that's why the partnership between New Destiny and the Family Justice Centers run through the mayor's office is so um, strong and so um, advantageous because all of those things that um, Julie mentioned, like the financial credit reports and all that, that can all be provided at the Family Justice Centers. So we have financial um, partners that come and look at people's credit. They help them do credit reports all right there. So it's literally you go through one door and you can be referred to someone to help you with your credit repair. You can be referred to somebody for long-term counseling. We actually have housing legal services lawyers now because the city's been doing an amazing job really investing in um, more legal services in housing court to help people stay in their homes and prevent evictions and so we have those partners there as well so I think by housing a project like Project Home within that kind of multi-service center mm -hmm. it really strengthens um, their results um, and allows them to have more kind of life-changing results to be able to have people stay in shelter for two years is really yeah. amazing yeah so. What are some of kind of the long-term goals for Project Home there, Julia? Uh, the goal for the pilot was to house 40 families, and we were supposed to complete that by September. So we're definitely ahead of the curve. We were not expecting 100% retention, um, and so that's that's been a, a surprise, but one a happy one at that. So we're definitely looking to expand and continue doing the work that we do. We're currently looking to uh, find funders to help us do that, and the hope is that, to continue to do it at all the five FJCs. Currently, we're, we're at three of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And the other, I think, really great part of the program that Julie has not mentioned is not only has it housed over 40 people, but it does have housing tips workshops. So it's actually provided individual workshops to anyone who's looking to kind of just understand what all of their options are, because it's, it's a that's complicated, right? right? As someone who works in it, it's still we have to go to all day <coughs> trainings to train people on the right. you know the different options available, and they do great workshops for um, clients of the center to help them prepare their applications for housing. And they've trained over I um, guess two hundred. It's over three hundred yeah. at this wow. point. Uh, we've had sixty seven workshops since the beginning of the pilot. Yeah. Right, right, and so that's all still done through the mayor's office. All through office. the family justice centers, yeah. All on site well, at the centers. All right. Well, Jennifer and Julie, thank you so very much for being in studio today. This was a great conversation. Great. Okay, thank thanks you for, for having us. us. All right. <laughs> when we come back, getting black boys to read in a familiar setting. Finally from us, a continuing series, Literacy NYC, takes a look at the Barbershop Books program. The United States Department of Education reports that more than 85% of America's black male fourth grade students are not proficient in reading. Former kindergarten teacher, comedian, and author Alvin Irby founded Barbershop Books in 2013 to help boys ages 4 to 8 identify as readers by connecting books to a male-centered space. We hear more in this report produced by Mariev Ami. I was sitting in a barbershop getting a haircut one day and one of my students came into the shop and he was just sitting down for like 10 or 15 minutes just kind of staring out the window 
uh, with his like bored look. And I was sitting there looking at him and thinking like, he should be practicing his reading right now. And I wished I had a children's book to give him, but I didn't. And so it was kind of, at that moment, this kind of perfect storm that created the idea. Like, you know, someone should put little reading spaces in barbershops. Barbershops are cultural centers, you know. Kids start going to the, boys start going to the barbershops usually around age two or three. Um, and they come at least once a month or sometimes twice a month, depending. Whenever you have any type of significant event in your life, you go get a cut. And so part of barbershop books work is we want to try and leverage the relationship that barbers have with young boys to hopefully get more boys to really, you know, identify as readers and feel a lot more positively about, you know, reading and about books. But I thought that it was a smart idea. I read chapter books, mostly books that are very detailed and are very long, so I don't read them too quick. Kids are so much on social media and on tablets and stuff, and if they have something else to keep them occupied, you know, instead of electronics, it's a great thing. We do see kids reading more. We um, actually push them to do it, too. When you look at the first few years of school, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, there are almost no black male teachers, right? And then a lot of young black boys are raised by single mothers, so they may not necessarily have, you know, male, black male reading models at home, but they go to the barbershop. We like role models to the kids. And um, also, you could say we like babysitters to the, you know, parents come drop their kids off here. and works hand in hand, you know? I wrote a book, my first children's book, it's called Gross Greg, and it's about a little kid who loves to eat his boogers. You call them boogers, but Gross Greg, he calls them delicious little sugars. Uh, and, I mean, the reason why I wrote this book is because when I was teaching kindergarten and first grade, a lot of the books that had black characters, they were very serious about slavery, segregation, you know, civil rights, which are important topics, but these aren't the only books that children should have access to that have characters that kind of look like them. And that's part of the reason why our selection, our curated list at Barbershop Books includes many humorous titles. And we believe that if we can create the type of reading experiences that help boys to identify as a reader, then they will read for fun. Many children's early reading experiences in school are almost exclusively skill-based. It means every time they pick up a book, someone's asking them to take a test or answer questions, and those things don't necessarily cultivate a child's intrinsic motivation to read. So when they leave school, they stop reading because for them, reading is about a test or reading is about, uh, you know, a skill. And what we want kids to understand about barbershop books is that reading is actually something that you can do anywhere at any time. I think it's great. I think it's food for thought, you know? It's, and they're, they're like sponges, so they, they need it, you know? It's like the best, let's say like the best nutrients for the brain. Everyone doesn't have access to these things. And yeah, if you get a, bar, if you get a haircut and you're able to get a haircut and get a few minutes of reading in, I think that's a great thing. We have child-friendly reading spaces in about 56 barbershops right now um, in just over 20 cities uh, in about 13 states. And our goal is, is to expand into 800 barbershops over the next three years in 20 target cities. Philadelphia, Atlanta, Chicago, DC, Baltimore, Detroit. We want at the end of the day for young black boys to say three words, I'm a reader. It starts in the neighborhoods, it starts in the barbershops. Let's put some more good into it. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Till next time, be independent-minded.